Welcome to the Hollowed Halls of Gotham Outsiders Academy. Hello, and welcome to the Gotham Outsiders Academy, Episode 2. In this show, we take a break from our regular programming and we talk in depth about concepts in psychology, the world, academic spaces, through the lens of Batman. If you missed our first episode, we covered asexuality in depth. Please go back and listen to it. And you will also notice that it's been a little while since our last episode, but this is going to come back as a regular series now. And we're going to be doing a brief focus series on the topic of gender. There's a lot of reasons why I decided to do a series on gender right now through Go. Among them are that I just recently gave a talk at a conference about Batman and what it says about gender. And the fact that a lot of conversations lately in the DC Comics community have been unfortunately just as uh, charged around gender as they unfortunately often are in this fandom. But the primary reason that I wanted to do this topic now is because of the people like myself in the trans community and what's going on in the trans community here in the U.S. We are in a time in the U.S. where there are 414 different legislative laws that are either passed or going to be voted on or discussed or going up before Congress that are limiting, discriminating against, and otherwise harming our trans community in the U.S. It is a difficult and painful time, and it is a time where, for all of us, learning is important. So I want to take a moment from our show and slow down and really talk about gender, all things gender, through the lens of our man, Batman. If you have been following me on any of the social medias, you know that I recently completed the Trans Rights Readathon. It was a very exciting event uh, where many, many people got together to read trans books and promote trans authors and raise money for different trans charities and funds. I hope you'll go on and look at Insta, Twitter, or Hive and see kind of what I covered for it. But in short, it was a week where all of the focus became about reading trans art and promoting trans charities. And it was inspiring and beautiful and it was lovely to feel that shared experience and it was not enough. It was important and good, and it did exactly what it set out to do, but it was not enough. We can't have one week focused on trans people and let it go. So instead, this spring and summer here on Go, we're going to focus on gender. I'm going to take you to class, gender and sexuality 101, if you will. It's focusing especially on gender for now. So today's episode will be an introduction to the topic. Each week, we'll come back and talk more about different aspects of gender and gender theory uh, through the Batman lens. I know it's serious at the moment, and the, the topic is hard because of what's going on in the world, but there will be moments of levity, too, as we talk about this. I hope you'll join me for these segments and that you'll share them for people who might need to understand this topic more. DC fandom has not historically been a place where gender diversity has been safe or celebrated. It is becoming increasingly more welcome, but even still, it's very easy to just be a woman or non-binary person who says an opinion online and gets piled on. Believe me, I know we can do our part to make it a safer and more welcoming place by learning, educating ourselves and others, and doing the work. Let's go. So let's start out. What is gender and why on earth would it ever be something we should talk about through Batman? 
Well, first of all, let's just make sure we're defining our terms and understanding these concepts. Gender is a social construct that assigns people roles, tasks, responsibilities, and inspected ways of being in the world based largely on the sex they were assigned at birth. This is the definition that was given by the book Trans Plus. Uh, I think it's really accessible, so I'm using it here. But we should probably unpack it a little. What are we talking about when we say a social construct? We might get into that topic more in future episodes, but essentially when something is socially constructed, it's the idea that we have together collectively as a society agreed what something means. Language is socially constructed. The words we use don't have any specific meanings except for the meaning that we all agree on. So when we say that gender is a social construct, that doesn't mean it doesn't matter or that it's not real. It matters and it is real, but it means that what we have come to understand as gender is something that society decided on versus something more inherent than that. Gender is something that assigns people roles, tasks, and responsibilities, and expected ways of being. So when we're talking about gender, a lot of times we are talking about these gender roles or tasks. We're talking about the ways we are expected to be in society. If you are perceived as a woman or if you are perceived as a man, those roles are different. And we'll get into that in more detail going forward. The ways we are expected to be in the world are often really impacted by that. For example, in, throughout history, there have been different expectations on the different genders. There was a time in history where men were expected to work and women were expected to cook. Those were gender roles, tasks, and responsibilities. That was the way that expectations were set out for gender. And while those have changed, there are still expectations around gender. And these are largely based on the sex that we are assigned at birth. So when somebody looks at your physical characteristics, things like your genitals, they assign you these specific roles. There's no active reason why it has to be that way, except that society has decided it is so. So gender is complicated and there's a lot that goes into it, but that's our starting place. This is where we're kind of going to start. Obviously, I've explained why we're talking about gender, but why on earth would a Batman show be the place to talk about gender? And the answer is actually Batman is an amazing place to start talking about gender. Batman is a character that has existed since the you know era of the Second World War. That means that Batman as a character has been continuously written through the changing of times where we have seen significant shifts in what we understand and expect about gender. And because of that, we see that those ideas and concepts reflected in Batman and his surrounding comics. There is a lot of different aspects. If you look back at the old Silver Age, you'll see things like, you know, Batman being hyper-masculine, there being virtually no women, and if there are, there's very, very set roles for them, and you see things changing as women are added to the story, there are more regular characters, maybe they are love interests for a while, and then they eventually get to become heroes. We see these changes because we get to see Batman through the ages, which makes him sort of a unique, and superheroes in general, a unique cultural artifact where we can trace the changes in society based on what's happening in a Batman comic. But there's more to it than that. Batman represents something specific to us. He represents a gendered ideal. He represents an ideal gendered body type. He represents ideas that we can go even deeper gendered subtext and things of that nature. So over the course of the next several episodes, we will talk about ideas like how Batman discusses things such as body image ideals, how social roles are depicted through Batman, how things like sexual standards for different genders are reflected in Batman comics. 
and how things like queer coding and you know trans ratings of superhero characters can give us a deeper understanding of gender. We will talk about what it looks like to queer Batman's gender and to understand gender queer narratives through the cowl. And we will talk about what in the hell Batman has to do with drag queens. And the answer is a lot and it's super interesting. For today, let's start by talking about sort of the big broad ideas. Batman as a gender ideal. So what I mean by that is if gender is a social construct, one of the things that has to happen, quote unquote, in society is there has to be ideals, something set up as the way we expect people to be based on their gender. And sort of the the person that's held up that we measure things by. The interesting thing about Batman is in many ways throughout history, he has existed as a sort of gendered ideal. He is what we expect a masculine man to be. He is tough. He is strong. He is at peak physical form. He is wealthy, aka successful. And he has women completely throwing themselves at him. So in a lot of ways, there's some essential parts of Batman, which are what men are expected to live up to. There's also some of the problematic aspects we can see in him. So if we live in a society, as we do, where the idea of boys don't cry or men are supposed to repress their emotions, who is more emotionally repressed than the man in the cowl? He holds his emotions in and holds them at arm's length. If you wanted to be very on the surface about it, you could say that he is able to overcome his emotions and do what needs to be done and is very driven by logic. If you want to get deeper, as many writers have, you can examine the ways that he suppresses his emotions to his own detriment, to the detriment of those around him, how that impacts his family, his self, even his ability to do well at his job. While he may think that a cold, logical way of viewing things is ideal for his job, maybe he would do better if he was able to understand and connect to his own feelings and not be blindsided by them. So Batman is in many ways the expectations of gender. And we see that playing out in writers like Frank Miller, who exaggerates those aspects of Batman to the point of him being a symbol of toxic masculinity. And we can, and have, if you look at our past Miller episodes, discuss whether that's an intentional way to examine Batman's toxic masculinity, or if it is just a way to say you're examining it while actually participating in creating a toxic masculine standard. I think it's interesting, whatever Frank Miller's intention, that the peop- that are people who are often drawn to it are people who subscribe to more toxic masculine roles. Whether it is meant as a commentary or not, there is a tendency for, as we sometimes say on this show, dude bros to embrace the toxicity in Batman. He becomes the man we want to be. If you look at this, uh, why people will describe Batman as their favorite hero, and they will say things like he's a badass, a gendered expectation, but they will also say something that is particularly revealing. People will often, or specifically, men who subscribe to more toxic masculine traits will say that Batman is someone that they can be. He is an achievable hero. We'll hear this a lot. People will say, I I could be Batman. That's why he's my favorite. Any of us could be Batman. Now, on the surface, this is an interesting claim. People don't go around saying I could be Superman because, of course, Superman is a space alien. Superman has superpowers given to him by being from not of this world. Anyone can't, by definition, be Superman. But the idea that anyone can be Batman is an old one. After all, given enough training, couldn't we all be Batman? Of course, this actually isn't remotely true. Batman has many qualities that are very specific. He has privilege, and I don't just mean white male privilege, though he does have that. He has wealth privilege. Batman is able to be Batman because he can afford to be Batman. 
He can afford the gadgets. He can afford the cars. He can afford to spend his nights out because he doesn't have to spend his days working. Batman is not a working class hero. Batman is a wealthy hero. He also can afford to spend his life sculpting his body and his frame. If you think about uh, the more we learn about the fitness industry and diet culture, it is very clear that a lot of the things that make people what some people would consider an ideal form is the ability to do that. The ability to afford the healthiest food, to afford the best exercise regimens. If we look at the people who are the most superhero bodied people in our society, we would have to say actors, right? Or bodybuilders, people who are able financially to spend all of their time focused on crafting the art of their body. The everyday person who has to work a job and doesn't have a lot of money can't do that. It's simply not possible. If you want to know more about this topic, I fully recommend checking out the podcast maintenance phase, which goes into all the different privilege and aspects that go into being able to maintain things like fitness and thinness. Those things are a privilege. There's also his body has to be able to do that, which not everyone's is. He has to be able to achieve that form, able to work in that way, not having problems like chronic illness or disabilities. He has to be able to be Batman physically and be able to work on creating the Batman body, literally. The body that Batman has, that ideal male form, that that ev- the expectation of it is something that is takes a lot of devotion. Look at the actor Kamal Najiani. If you look at how he transformed himself from the body of a regular comic <clears throat> comedian to the body of a Marvel movie star, you can hear him talk about how much work it was and how much time he put into it and how if he'd had a different day job, that would not have been possible. Not everyone can achieve Batman's form, which is particularly interesting when you think about the fact that Batman does represent the ideal male gaze, man's form. We'll talk more about male and female gaze in upcoming episodes, but for now, sticking to the form. Batman is that classic Dorito body with the wide shoulders and thin waist, rippling muscles. It should be noted though, many of the muscles that he has drawn are not the muscles that you would have if you were actually fighting crime. They're the muscles you would have if you were a bodybuilder, which are often not functional muscles for the record, depending on who draws him, but a lot of the classic designs. He is sort of this idealized masculine form. If you listen to our Flame Con panel, or if you were one of the lucky ones who were there, you remember that Jadzia Axelrod talked about the idea of Eugene Sandow. Eugene Sandow published a bodybuilder magazine in 1898. In it, he highlighted the quote unquote ideal masculine form, which remains the ideal form to this day. Again, Dorito chip, broad shoulders, skinny waist, rippling muscles. He designed a magazine to kind of highlight that. This is early versions of what would be like a men's health magazine now, where you always have those, you know, super hot. Chris Hemsworth's on the cover, shirtless, flexing. This is the ideal male form. According to other men, Batman is what men want to look like, not necessarily what women want men to look like. And I should say, what straight men want men to look like, what they themselves hope they could be when they're saying things like, I could be Batman if given enough time. So Batman represents this idealized form, something that you can only achieve through privilege and wealth, but who sort of exudes masculinity in a very, very, very traditional way, so traditional that it has been the case since 1898. And comic book heroes were based on these Eugene Sandow comic uh, magazines. That's where their design came from. It was inspired by those So that this is a direct line from someone deciding what the ideal masculine form was to what superheroes ultimately look like. 
Batman represents a sort of paragon of a specific kind of masculinity. The masculinity that we all as a society have created, have decided on, what was considered masculine has changed over the years. For example, pre-World War II, the color pink and wearing heels were considered masculine, where you would never say that now. Why we can look at Batman and learn about gender is that Batman, in his very design, was created to be a very specific gender representation. He was to model the bodybuilders of Eugene Shadow and to represent the World War II and post-World War II idea of classic masculinity. He was to be the manly man that boys want to grow up to be. He was to represent, in all ways, the male gaze. But it didn't stay like that. Though those traces can still be there, we know that Batman attracted a much wider audience. After all, you're here, and so am I. So what happened? How did we go from 1940s Batman's <clears throat> extreme masculinity to him not just representing the male gaze, but also representing all the gays, if you know what I mean. That was a bad pun. I'm sorry. How did we get there? How did we get to a place where Batman has a lot more in common with drag than with bodybuilders? That's it for today's episode, but if you want to know the answer to that question, you'll tune in next time. Same masculine bat place, same weird bat time tune back in for the rest of our show and let's learn about gender together if you have questions or comments or ideas you can hit us up on any of the social medias or come talk to me specifically about batman gender ideal bodies and how we can start making a difference by learning more until next time The Court of Owls hopes you've enjoyed this program.